um, I see that we have four presentations uh, for this afternoon, so uh, we will need to be on time. I will give to all the presenters uh, 20 minutes. I will reactivate, uh, I will, let's say, signal when uh, uh, a couple of minutes are, uh, are missing to the end of, of the time, and then uh, uh, after each presentation, there will be five minutes to Q&A. Um, so I invite everybody to try to respect the time. And actually, I always suggest that thing that the uh, Q&A is the most uh, interesting part and useful also for the presenter. So, uh, well, maybe we can start. And if there are people joining, uh, uh, we will welcome them. Uh, when they show up. So we, we, we can start uh, with you, Ingela, with your presentation on a sustainability analysis of the German energy, uh, energy transition using TOPSIS. So uh, the screen is yours, 20 minutes to you. Thank you very much. I'm not too familiar with Zoom, so I had to find where I can unmute myself. Uh, thanks a lot if there's any hassle with the uh, technique uh, technique or, or the transfer or whatever, just, just give me a shout. Um, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present our research results today. Um, I'm here standing for Heidi Hottenhut and Tobias Fiera as well. We are all coming from the Institute for Industrial Ecology from Pforzheim University. Our research, research was conducted within a project that has been funded by the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy over the last three and a half years. Um, the project was called INOSIS, um, which stands for the Integrated Sustainability Assessment and Optimization of Energy Systems. The main objectives of the project were to develop a new generic modeling and assessment approach for energy scenarios. And the second main objective has been to conduct a multi-criteria assessment and optimization of technically and structurally feasible development pathways of the energy system in Germany. So that, that's the framework. Um, you see there were several other research institutes that were working together with us uh, the lead has been um, with the German Aerospace Center, um, uh, a department sitting at Stuttgart that's also working strongly in the field of energy systems analysis. So why actually did we apply for the project? What was the, the idea? Um, as most of you have probably heard and what we also have in many other countries is that we need to decarbonize our sectors and that implies a lot of changes. Um, we have different pathways that are actually feasible to come to decarbonize systems. And so um, all over the world, research institutes calculate pathways, decarbonization pathways in order to have a decarbonized energy sector in 2050, 2040, depending on the framework. So that has also been done for Germany. We have several research institutes that calculate scenarios and normally they do not only calculate one scenario, but they calculate several scenarios. So we have a lot of different energy scenarios for 2050 that are leading us to decarbonize sectors, 80%, 95% um, CO2 reduction, whatever you want. But if you look at the results of these um, energy scenarios, even though we have the same starting point, meaning the energy sector that we find in Germany today, uh, we have more or less the same targets, a decarbonized energy sector. The energy sector in 2050 in Germany looks very different in the different scenarios, meaning we have different final, final energy demand of the sectors, we have different storage needs or um, the different technologies are utilized to very different levels. That means these energy scenarios or the power, power systems that we will have in the future also come to very different overall impacts. So the question is, which pathway to follow? And in order to identify a good 
pathway for the future, we went for sustainability as an umbrella concept for desirable future development. Also there, a lot of research has been done already, but most of the research comes up to, we have a lot of different indicators for social development, for economic development, um, or for ecological development. And the results of these indicators are measured in different units. So we cannot easily um, see the trade-offs between them. And so the question remains, which scenario is best? And a solution for this problem is given by MADM, which is multi-attribute decision-making. MADM structures the decision-making process to, to identify the best alternative of a set of given alternatives, meaning we can identify good compromises between conflict and targets, and there's a lot of different methods that can be applied here. Nevertheless, all of the methods have more or less the same procedure. We need to define the objectives first. Then we need to find criteria that stand for the objectives that operationalize these objectives. And we need to assign weights to the different criteria, meaning how important is the indicator or the criteria for the need. We need to define the alternatives. In between, we need to derive a decision. For the different alternatives, we need to set up data tables and data functions. And finally, we calculate the scores and so identify the best alternative. And finally, we conduct sensi sensitivity analysis. Within our project, we decided to go for TOPSIS. TOPSIS is the technique of order preference by similarity to ideal solution. It's been originally introduced by Wang and Hune in 1981 and more or less today still being performed or conducted in the way they, they actually propose it. Um, Topsys assesses the alternatives in comparison to the best and worst performance within each criterion. So the procedure is that you have a set of your alternatives and you calculate the indicator values. Um, you set up the initial decision matrix and normalize it to weigh this normalized decision matrix. And then you determine the ideal solutions, meaning the best and the worst value for each criterion of all alternatives. And finally, you calculate the so-called relative closeness coefficient. So meaning, for example, you have one indicator climate change. Then you look at all your alternatives, how good or how bad they perform in climate change. And then you calculate the closeness coefficient uh, depending on the distance to the best and the worst performance of the indicator climate change all over your different alternatives. And so you do that for every indicator that you're looking at. And TOPSIS gives you um, calculation methods in order to sum that all up to come to one single final score. And that is the closeness coefficient. And then you rank your alternatives by this closeness coefficient. So when we applied TOPSIS, we followed um, the steps I showed you before. And I will now go through it with you step by step by step. So first, as I said, we had the idea to define or to find out which is the most sustainable decarbonization pathway for the German NSG sector. Uh, most sustainable meaning we looked at economic, ecologic, and social aspects. And we looked at a lot of different researchers and came up with these indicators in order to analyze the sustainability performance of the energy scenarios. So we have the categories climate change, ecosystem quality being explained by five different indicators, human health by six different indicators, resources by four different indicators. We have the category of social economic indicators like system costs or unemployment rate. And we have social technical category, which we have 
it's diversity of the sectors. Um, and that actually stands for or has the idea in mind um, how good is security of supply. Um, for the environmental indicators, we used uh, a life cycle assessment approach. For the macroeconomic, like number of setup and reduced jobs, or regional inequality or an unemployment rate, we had a research institute that performed analysis with a macroeconomic model. And for system costs and um, diversity of the power generation capacity, we had a typical energy systems analysis model. And the last column, you see that we have a subset of the criteria for DCE. DCE stands for discrete choice experiment. Um, and that leads me to the next slide. The first steps um, of MADM is to define the objectives, and the second step is to have to define the criteria and the weights. But where do actually the weights come, meaning how important is one indicator to me compared to another one? Um, our idea within the project was to involve public, to ask normal people in the street how important the different indicators are to them. Um, we had colleagues from um, Socioeconomic Institute within the project that performed this analysis, um, but we soon came to the conclusion that it is too complicated for the public um, to assess all the different uh, indicators. And so we defined a smaller subset for the so-called discrete choice experiment um, that you see here on the left-hand side the weights of. Um, within the public opinion, climate change is by far the most important indicator. So the public assigned more than 50% weight to um, the climate change indicators and all the other indicators, for example, also system costs only roughly 9%, or um, the number of setup and reduced jobs, we have only um, 2%, for example. For the entire indicator set, we defined the weights by experts decision. So we had an expert panel that looked at the different indicators and assign the weights to them. And if you look at the two different indicator sets and the weight, it looks quite different because if you look at climate change, you see here roughly 20% and here it's more than 50%. Nevertheless, if you look at the category system that I showed you the slide before, um, it's actually not that different because if we group ecologic, more economic and more social aspects, we come to similar weights for the categories. So it's, it looks quite more different than it actually is. What we then need is alternatives in between which we want to decide. And um, I brought you just one figure of the alternatives in order to give you a rough idea um, what the different alternatives looks like. So you see it's 10 different scenarios that we analyze, five of them coming to an 80% of CO2 reduction in 2050, and the other um, five, uh, five scenarios lead to 95% of CO2 reduction. The problem was when we looked at the scenarios in the studies, we didn't find all the information we needed in documents. Um, furthermore, not all the information that we wanted to assess or not all the indicators that we were wanted to assess were actually analyzed within the studies. Furthermore, the deeper we looked into the studies, we figured out um, they're not really comparable because even though the, the framework assumptions were similar, they were still too different in order to have a good feeling when you would directly compare them. So what we did is that we looked into detail into the assumptions and the idea behind the different scenarios and derived so-called storylines. This has been primarily done by uh, the DLR, the German Aerospace Center. And so they came up with 10 different ideas on how the German energy sector should be transformed as concluded in these studies. 
And then we recalculate, we remodeled with the DLR models, these scenarios in order to have all the indicator values that we need. And these are the result of our recalculated scenarios already. And so you see it's 100% of the installed capacity and how we have the different shares. For example, in scenario one, we have natural gas, we have um, other conventional, we have wind on and offshore, we have photovoltaics, uh, biomass, hydro, and so on. I guess most of you are familiar in reading these um, slides about installed capacity of power systems. Um, this symbol here indicates the absolute figure of installed capacity. And so you can see that in terms of installed capacity, the results are very different. We came to scenarios that had about 200, 300 um, of gigawatt installed. And scenario nine, for example, um, due to the high share of photovoltaics, comes to almost 1,500, 1,600 gigawatts of installed capacity that will be needed in 2050. So that is basically what we looked at, 10 different scenarios for decarbonization of the German energy sector, 80% reduction to 95% reduction. Um, same idea behind them, but quite different results in terms of um, installed capacity, shares of um, energy carriers, and so on. So here are our first results for the DCE indicators, that meaning the smaller set of indicators that has been judged by the public or by groups from the public. And the blue bars are the ranks. So scenario eight is rank one, scenario one is rank two, scenario six is rank um, three and so on. Uh, but I want also to address um, you or to, to refer to the light green bars because that is the absolute absolute value of the closeness coefficient. And you can see the ranks are quite clear, one, two, three, four, five. So we have a clear result. But if you look, for example, at the closeness coefficient of scenario six to seven, you see how similar they actually are. And on the other hand, that means how actually complicated or all questions whether you really can derive a clear rank between scenario six and scenario seven. Having that in mind, um, and if we now then look at the entire the results for the entire indicator set, you see here also we have scenarios where we have quite similar closeness coefficients. And also what we see, and you see that here on the right-hand side, that the ranks change. We have different weights for the indicators and where we have a smaller or bigger indicator set. So for the discrete choice experiment, scenario one has been rank two, whereas it is rank one for the entire indicator set. Um, if you look at the last ranks, 10 and nine, they are stable, but for example, scenario six um, for the entire indicator set only comes to rank seven, whereas for the discrete choice experiment, it's rank three. So what's the conclusion? We conclude that applying TOPSIS and MABM method, we can show at least the tendency for more or less sustainable scenarios, because as you've seen, for example, scenarios nine and 10 for both subsets were always the ones performing um, or with the lowest performance. But what we've also been seeing is that we come to clear ranks, even though the closeness coefficients have no clear distinction. So that's a, a bit of a problem with that method. We have a very strong influence of the weights. We have derived that by showing the difference um, between the discretoids experiment on the end and the entire indicator set. And also a sufficient stakeholder involvement in the weighing process uh, poses a problem if you have a large number and high complexity of criteria as we had in our study. 
Nevertheless, um, the MADM method has been the only method um, that was, or, or was the only solution to come to a clear conclusion, um, as we had no leading in indicator or technology that we actually could identify for the performance in the single uh, indicators. And what was astonishing for us was that we've seen that um, the 95% production scenarios, as well as the 80% production scenarios, um, were able to reach top ranks. So it was not that always the 95% in the uh, scenarios performed better than the 80% or the other way around. Um, for the future, what we are currently um, preparing is a paper where we compare our TOPSIS results with the results of two other MADM methods, um, Promety and Wake Sun method. Um, we are currently performing principal component analysis um, to our results in order to identify important indicators and technologies. And what we've also done and what we want to have a deeper look at is um, the application of the TOPSIS variation. It's a so-called in R TOPSIS um, that gives a global normalization perspective um, to our results. So I'm looking forward to your questions and thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Ingela, or danke schön. You're uh, welcome. I, um, it's, I'm not an expert of uh, scenarios, but I see that your research touched a, a very relevant and often uh, under, underlooked aspects. Uh, why we prefer a certain pathway to net zero than another one because often is uh, given uh, for granted but actually there are many ways to to go in the same place and uh, it's uh, important to organize in a rational way the the process in according to which we, we choose uh, these pathways um I invite the people uh, in the room, I, I so that we increase a bit in number, to raise the hand, to switch on the camera if they want to uh, ask um, something uh, to Angela about uh, either the methodology of her research or uh, the specific uh, um, conclusions for the um, energy transition in, in Germany. Is there anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> anybody? If not, I will make a question, Ingela, because maybe I, I miss in your presentation. Uh, you highlighted the pretty clear that uh, although not totally different, there are some still some differences in the ranking and in the closeness indicator. But I did not fully understand why some of the scenarios are, let's say, scored differently in your, in your chart. Could you explain it a bit better? Exactly, why the blue bar and the gray bar uh, sometimes are not, uh, let's say, comparable in the ranking? Oh, well, actually it's, um... You start with the green bars. That is actually the result that you derive. So you have like 0 0.65 for scenario seven, and then you have 0 0.58 for scenario one, um, 0 0.55 or whatever for scenario six. And then you, it's quite easy, you order them. Ah, okay. Ah, by, ah. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six. And so that's actually what, what, what is the, the thing. Uh, on the one hand, is, is, is a good thing of the method because you have a clear first, second, third, fourth, and so on place. But if you look, and that is actually what you, you then would give as um, a recommendation to politics, though we have a clear rank. But if you look into the detail and uh, in results, you see it's actually not that clear as you then would say. And so that is what we think is quite uh, questionable with the method. Ah, okay, crystal clear. It simply, I simply was uh, didn't not uh, read the uh, uh, correctly the the chart. So I now I perfectly got your message. There are maybe uh, scenarios eight, which is a bit different from the other, but then you have many others that uh, score pretty close. And yes. so, and this means that the 
uh, assumptions um, uh, may be influenced by some random uh, coincidence on the criteria can lead to significant, uh, can have a significant policy implications, but they are not really, it, it's an accident sometimes. It's not really uh, a strong difference. There is not so, such a strong difference in terms of uh, um, appropriateness of value of certain scenarios. That's it. I see, perfect, perfect. Uh, but then fortunately we have also some scenarios that are, they definitely score uh, less well like a nine and 10. Yes, that's it. And, and maybe I was also surprised to see that one of your scenarios you consider, it has a much higher installed capacity than all the other. It's massive more, this scenario nine. Yes, that's due to the assumptions. And when we select, there are far more than these 10 scenarios that we analyze yes. if you. And, and so we tried actually to find quite different scenarios in order to have all the, the different ideas. I don't know if it's the same um, in your research field, but here we really see that we have different streams of ideas behind on how to transform. So we try to get a scenario from all the different streams. And that was one of the streams, like we have storage, we have um, very high shares of photovoltaics. And so we need very high, um, and, and we have a very high, high electrification of other sectors. And so we came up to this huge installed capacity. I see, I see. Okay, so you, uh, uh, you, you pick a bit of scenarios also to show, to show uh, how then your method to assess them work and, uh, and clarify the debate. No, I think it's, it's definitely interesting. And, uh, uh, and now I understand fully. Thank you. So if, if there are no other questions by the other, we can uh, so thank you. Uh, can I please, a small uh, methodological question. Ah, please, please, Silvana. Uh, well, I uh, appreciate a lot of the big work that you have done and it is very complicated to, to, to have some solutions with these methods, which, uh, well, uh, many people try on that, uh, particularly when we when we speak with uh, um, social goals, when we want to take into account all the criteria, and at the end it is always question of uh, ponderation. So. Um, when you make the ponderation, how you ensure, for example, that uh, you, you obtain at the end net zero emissions? So, because it is a little bit difficult to, at the end, you, you say that, for, for example, uh, ecology is 50%, uh, uh, but if I make more jobs, uh, are you sure that you will have again net zero emissions or you have you will have more emissions thanks well the the for, it depends on on the system that you look at the the system we, we incorporated energy uh, meaning electricity heat and also mobility and so within that system, we calculated the scenarios that we came up to 95 or 80% reduction. So for the energy sector, I'm sure that for the alternatives we analyzed, we, we, we can keep um, the reduction, or that we will achieve the reduction. The question is whether actually we transfer significant um, emissions to other sectors that we do not see. But Actually, I would doubt it. I would say um, we, we cover the system as a whole and um, we wouldn't have too strong um, exports to other sectors as also the macroeconomic assessment of the um, GBS, GWS, the German Macroeconomic Institute. They also looked into the, the streams to the other, or import and export to other sectors and came to the conclusion that it's a, a sound result. So you, you, you do not have, uh, you are not sure that when you transport to, to transport, for example, this quantity of uh, mitigation is feasible or not? 
Yes, we are because transport. But I, I, I only took a slide of, of the electricity sector in order to to tell you how different our scenarios were. But uh, were but our uh, analysis incorporated electricity, heat, and transportation. So we had all sectors put in the studies. So the ninety five percent reduction that you see down here also applies uh, or incorporates the, the transportation sector already. Thank you. Thank you, Ingela. I think uh, we can move uh, to the next, uh, to Maria Bernadette. Uh, is, uh, I, I don't see, she's not here, or no. Ah, we are missing one speaker. <laughs> uh, okay, so we move to the, to the following one. Uh, she lost uh, her opportunity. So, uh, I, I'm Katarina, uh, I saw that you can uh, hear. So, can you, would you like to intervene now? Uh, yes, yes, I could now. Thank you. Thank you. I need to share the screen first, though. Yeah, so yeah, I'll please. Try to, I'll try to do that. And let me in the meanwhile uh, mention that uh, at the Florence School of Regulation, since most of you are working on modeling, in September we have a summer school on energy systems modeling, a kind of uh, in between uh, the, uh, the qualitative and quality. So maybe some students or, or younger colleagues of yours uh, could be interested in attending. Uh, Katarina, please. The screen is yours. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just want to go back to the having the video on. I see your presentation. Uh, you should only activate the F5, uh, could be, on the uh, bottom, uh, on the bottom right, where there is the. Um, um, you know, there is the symbol me. of uh, a starting presentation. Uh, okay, so I just go here, yeah. yeah? Yeah, and it should start in theory. Uh, I still see the pre-presentation mode. Uh, it's all gone black here on this side, but I think it's going to start again. Ah, okay. Because I had the same thing when it was a trial session. Ah, okay. <laughs> and now it's still going round and round. Or otherwise, I'm, just going you... to do, I'm going to do one thing to see if that helps. Otherwise, maybe try to disconnect for a moment and share the screen again. Uh, yeah, I can try that as well. Or otherwise, okay, ah, I think it's working now. Yes, it is. It is. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me just get started here. Okay, well, thank you very much for waiting, and I'm sorry for the for the um, late start. Uh, so I think uh, is it? Do we have 15 minutes? 20. You have 20 minutes. Okay. Oh, well, that's great. Okay, thank you. So, um, so what I'm going to talk today is really about um, <clears throat> how uh, about enabling demand response uh, in emerging economies. So, uh, I'm using the case of Chile uh, because basically uh, by 2050, uh, the electricity consumption in Chile is probably going to be triple what it is today, and most of it will be generated by um, variable renewable energy. 
Uh, and so uh, they do need a lot of system flexibility and uh, they've already, of course, taken a number of initiatives to try to get more flexibility into the markets. Um, and um, <clears throat> the method for this is basically um, is a comparative policy analysis uh, between Chile, France and the UK uh, through review of primary and secondary literature. Uh, and uh, I chose France and the UK because uh, they are the two countries that are most advanced in terms of uh, demand response in Europe. And in the same way as Chile and most uh, emerging economies, their interest in demand response is mainly driven by um, the increase in renewable energy. So quite different from the interest, the initial interest of the US, for example, in terms of demand response. Uh, this work in pro progress, so this is really uh, the beginning of uh, a project. So uh, you'll forgive me some, not everything is totally complete. Uh, so I don't know uh, <clears throat> whether you also work on demand response or, or how familiar you are with it. So this is just uh, a brief summary of um, what's demand response. So there are two types. There is a price demand response and explicit demand response. So price is uh, determined by the price. Um, so changes in price lead to temporary changes in electricity consumption. Uh, while explicit demand response uh, is... Um, is basically is dispatchable flexibility, which is traded in electricity markets uh, in the same way that uh, energy, the generation uh, is traded. And um, it's not uh, triggered by price, but of course there is a financial uh, compensation. Uh, so demand response can be uh, traded uh, in all markets. So for example, uh, in terms of the markets operated by the system operators, uh, demand response can, is quite good because uh, if you have many small loads, uh, especially if it's things like uh, heating or cooling systems, they can be adjusted instantaneously. Uh, and they reduce the need for uh, operating part loaded plants, so it's quite efficient. Uh, in the wholesale markets, um, they have the advantage they can lower electricity prices because of course, when there is more demand, the prices will be higher, uh, demand response will be more interested in participating and therefore they would lower the prices uh, and they also lower uh, price volatility and then uh, in capacity markets um, they can uh, they can provide capacity which uh, is quite useful in, in a number of situations but in particular when you have high magnitude but very low probability events so um, you'll see uh, later I'll talk about the case of France in which they do have extreme peaks of demand uh, but they do occur very rarely. So this is just to give an idea of what is the value of uh, demand response in electricity markets. And um, this is the, the good side. Of course, uh, there is a cost involved, which is how to actually adapt the markets to demand response. Uh, and this can be a long, uh, a long process because most of the markets are, all the regulations and everything has been defined in relation to generators. So uh, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a difficult, difficult process. Uh, so this is just a, a very brief overview of Tulis power sector. So it is a liberalized market, uh, which is also one of the reasons why it was chosen for the study. However, the way the markets are organized are quite different from those of France and the UK. So uh, it is a cost-based market. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of wholesale markets, it, it has the spot market, which is only, um, only generators can use it. And the financial contract markets, which is partly arranged via um, by auctions. So in terms of actually um, different parties agreeing contracts between themselves, agreeing prices, uh, it will be really between the generators and very, very large consumers. Uh, there are two types of consumers, two types. So the free consumers, which either the very large ones, uh, industry and, uh, and mining, which are the ones that can negotiate prices for electricity directly with generators. And they represent uh, about 45% of total consumers. And then you have regulated consumers, which is households and small businesses. Uh, and as the word says, uh, the prices are, uh, are regulated. Um, <clears throat> in terms of recent developments, and uh, again, the reason why uh, flexibility has become so important, uh, is that they are, uh, Chile is basically aiming to uh, become carbon neutral by 2050. 
And already before setting that target, uh, they had set a strategy in 2050 to actually um, uh, change their and uh, modernize their electricity system. Uh, and it includes uh, very high renewable energy targets. Uh, they have uh, connected that they had two very large electricity systems which are now connected, uh, which facilitates in terms of flexibility. Uh, and its transmission law, which also has uh, put a number of things in place um, to actually uh, increase the flexibility in the system. So it is, uh, it is recognized about uh, flexibility being uh, uh, something to look, to look at. So um, the, the comparison that I do, I do it uh, between uh, the three countries. I do it in terms of context. So uh, what is the context for the deployment of demand response? Uh, then I compare um, demand response policies or specific policies that are affecting uh, demand response and um, activities, demand response activities. And then finally, I compare uh, the situation of demand response in the electricity markets. So the first part about contextualizing demand response deployment. Uh, so this gives you an idea of what they have in common and what is different. So um, as you can see, so I'm just looking here at the time. So in terms, they have similar de um, decarbonization goals. And in all three countries, uh, energy related emissions are the main source of renewable energy. Therefore, the approach to decarbonization and achieving the carbon neutral target is the same. Uh, which is uh, decarbonizing the electricity system uh, by increasing renewable generation uh, and electrifying most of the energy system, so transport, heating, and part of industry. So all of that is in common. Um, they also plan to um, close down, oh, sorry, close down coal plants. And so the UK is uh, very close. They expect to uh, close down by 2025. Uh, France expects to close down by uh, 2022, but uh, car, France never had a lot of coal, so um, thermal generation was only about 8%. They almost relied mostly on nuclear. And for Chile, the date is 2040, uh, which is considerable, considering that about 40% of current generation is from coal, 40%. So it's quite a big, uh, a big change. Um, in terms of how much renewable they're going to have, so they all uh, expect to increase renewable uh, by a considerable amount. Uh, they have renewable energy targets, but they also basically is the expected levels of renewables. So both, all three of them, they expect to have higher than 50%. Uh, and this is, um, most of these increasing renewables is really solar and wind, so uh, intermittent generation. In Chile, the expected levels can be anything between 80 and 95%. So this is probably the first big difference is that the expected level of renewable energy is, very, is, is, much, is much higher. Um, there are also the changes in terms of electricity consumption and peak demand. So um, <clears throat> both, uh, 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 sorry, uh, so Chile expects to uh, increase energy consumption like most um, uh, emerging economies, economies a considerable increase. And it should be noted that this increase is despite the fact that they have uh, a lot of action that they intend to implement in relation to energy efficiency. And for achieving the uh, neutrality, the carbon neutrality target, at least 7% of greenhouse gas emissions reductions will come from energy efficiency. However, uh, despite that, energy consumption is still expected to increase uh, average energy per capita is lower than other OECD countries. Uh, and then as a, as a result of the increasing energy consumption, plus uh, the electrification of parts of the economy, we have a considerable increase in electricity consumption. Uh, and also an increase in peak demand. Um, France expects to meet a target uh, by reducing their energy consumption by 50%. Uh, so they do have an increase in electricity consumption, but this is lower, it's between 22 and 29%, uh, and no changes in peak demand. Uh, and the UK, the UK also uh, plans a reduction in energy consumption, but despite of that, um, there is an increase in electricity, in the consumption of electricity of nearly 100%, and also in terms of peak demand. <clears throat> So in terms of policy demand response, response to, so they have similar targets, uh, 
Uh, the challenge, I would say, uh, is considerable for all three countries, but particularly for Chile, because of both the uh, increase in electricity consumption and because of the uh, level of renewable deployment. But in terms of demand response, the situation is quite different. So um, uh, in Chile, what we have in terms of demand response is that uh, in 2019, uh, there was basically a change was made to uh, the electricity services law, which uh, changed the ancillary services, and in that context also regulated how demand response could participate. Uh, so uh, demand response is mentioned, it is specified that uh, aggregators can participate and aggregated demand can also participate. Uh, other mentions of uh, demand response are on the energy 2050, so on the strategy, uh, in which the idea is that uh, consumers will become smart consumers. Uh, so build, uh, the idea is uh, to actually fit uh, buildings with the necessary uh, technology to be able to contribute uh, to the system. Uh, and then there is also, in terms of institutional arrangements, the arrangements, there is a net billing law, which actually basically facilitates, sets a structure for how uh, domestic generators, so uh, part of the regulated consumers, they can actually sell energy. So this net billing law really gives an idea of how demand response could actually participate in the, in the markets. Um, the demand response policy process in um, the UK and, uh, and France, uh, they, are, they are more advanced. So uh, in both countries, uh, demand response is allowed in ancillary markets, um, in, the, uh, in France, also in the wholesale markets, both countries have capacity market. So they are quite advanced, advanced countries. What's interesting is that the process that led to <clears throat> the establishment of demand response uh, is quite different. So the UK seems to have started much earlier uh, so there was already some demand response before 2007, uh, but this is the first big program that actually attracted a lot of uh, demand response. Uh, and they also had the capacity market established much earlier, but by 2000, the access to the balancing mechanism was only in 2019, and they are currently trying to see how they can provide access to um, <clears throat> wholesale markets, but it has not been concluded yet. France. Uh, they seem to have done, uh, so France used to have a lot of demand response because their uh, electricity demand is very, very sensitive to weather. So uh, a, one, um, a one degree uh, increasing, uh, decrease in temperature can lead to uh, 2.4 uh, gigawatts of change in terms of demand. And it has been like this for a very long time. Uh, it is because they have a lot of heating, electric heating. And so they've used demand response since at least the 1970s, but it was price demand response. When the electricity markets became liberalized, uh, the price demand response stopped working so well. And so the levels of demand response in the country dropped by nearly, by, uh, nearly half. So from about six gigawatts, it dropped to about 2.8 gigawatts. So then in 2010, they started a whole process of trying to facilitate the participation of demand response in the market. So explicit demand response this time. And about around the same, same time, so in 2012, uh, there was an initiative by the European Union uh, and a directive, the Energy Efficiency Directive, that also um, mentioned uh, demand response and the need for uh, allowing the participation of demand response in the markets, and also that to make the markets um, uh, friendly to demand response in the sense of uh, actually adapting the regulation to their participation. So all in all, led really to this big change here in France and continue to support the, front, the, the changes in, uh, in the UK. So in terms of um, electricity markets, so we have, <clears throat> what I just want to point out here is a few things. So as you can see, uh, now uh, France allows demand response uh, in uh, their ancillary markets. And they also have a program which is only for demand response, which is the demand response call for, for tender. Uh, and in addition to that, they have interruptible contracts, which they recently changed to actually allow a wider, um, <clears throat> uh, more integration of demand response. Uh, 
So they have now two different systems, one which basically caters for big, sub, a big consumers and another one for a variety of, con of consumers. The UK has here only three mechanisms, but they actually they used to have 11. So in about 2016, they had 11 different ways that demand response could participate. Uh, a lot of variety, great, but the thing is that also that brought with it a lot of complexity. So there was criticism on account of that, and uh, they have been changing their uh, products to actually make them to simplify the system. Uh, and about a year ago, they had about six, uh, uh, six different products. And here for 2020, uh, there, was, there were only three. Uh, <clears throat> so demand response is now allowed to participate in the balancing mechanism. So that is quite, uh, quite recent. And this is a very good thing because uh, the balancing mechanism actually is the largest uh, flexibility market in the UK. So uh, it is uh, more uh, profitable. Uh, another interesting thing to comment about the UK is about the optional downward flexibility management which basically this product was created just because of the lockdown. Uh, there was a huge reduction in electricity consumption, like in, in the rest of the world as Elena, well. Yeah. If I may, uh, you have uh, still a couple of minutes. Okay, all right. So I won't talk about this. I'll just go to the conclusions then, but thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So this is just very quickly uh, the capacity market. So both France and the UK have capacity markets with very different systems. Uh, the wholesale market. So uh, in the UK, demand response can only participate implicitly, while in, in France, it can also trade directly. So I'll go to the discussion, the conclusion, which I think is the main part. So um, the three main lessons, I think, from the analysis of France and the UK is that although what is driven the demand uh, response deployment is really the integration of renewables. There are actually other benefits, as for example, dealing with extreme peaks of demand in France and with uh, the reduction in demand during the lockdown in the UK. Another one is that opening the markets can be a, a very long process. Uh, and the third one is about flexibility and policy uncertainty. So that both France and the UK, they actually did change their uh, regulations uh, quite a bit in the space of 15 years, and uh, the changes were positive. Uh, it made flexi uh, it made easier for demand response to participate. But at the same time, uh, there has been criticisms in both countries about policy uncertainty. And with policy uncertainty, uh, potential demand response providers, they, they are reluctant to participate because of risk. So getting the balance between these two is important. Um, in terms of some reflections about the deployment of demand response uh, in Chile. Um, so uh, I'd like to make two. So one is about the evaluation of demand response costs and benefits. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, there's need for more technical uh, studies of the technical potential of demand re response in Chile, uh, and both in relation to free and regulated consumers. Um, because at the moment, regulated consumers cannot participate, but if we are looking at the future, uh, that is, is feasible and they may have actually more immediate flexibility than uh, many, of, many of the large industrial and mining companies. Also in evaluating the costs and benefits to consider the different the, the benefits of demand response, not just for the integration and for example, for um, <clears throat> uh, dealing with uh, reducing curtailment and short term balancing, but also uh, in the case of Chile, it could be very important in, in, of extreme weather events. The country is very vulnerable to extreme weather events. So a demand response could play a similar role to what it plays in France in relation to peak demand. Uh, and these are just some examples, but the idea is not to think just in terms of renewables, but it actually think more widely of the benefits. The other one is about the developing of um, friendly markets. Um, at the moment, they have started defining how demand response can participate in uh, the ancillary markets, however, in theory, uh, it can also participate in the spot market, in the financial contract market, in the RTE, so the system operated auctions. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, it's worthwhile exploring these possibilities because they have been done elsewhere. And this brings me to the last point, which is that um, Chile has very ambitious targets in terms of renewable energy uh, and has a, a, a relatively short time frame. So, it's important to actually try to see, is it possible to actually speed up the process of opening the markets and of uh, realizing the potential of demand response 
uh, in the country. And uh, yes, I think that um, closes my, uh, my presentation. And thank, thank you, you very much for listening. Thank you to you, Katarina. So now the audience, is anybody uh, willing to ask something, anything to Katarina? Uh, yeah. Any issue, suggestion, comment uh, is more than welcome. Don't be shy again. <laughs> In the meanwhile, you think uh, uh, I have a, a, a curiosity to ask you, Caterina. Um, mm -hmm. You said you have regulated customers in Chile. Mm -hmm. um, are all residential customers captive? Is there a threshold? What is the category of customers that is regulated? Because I assume that large users uh, can, uh, can buy electricity on the yeah. wholesale market. Yes, yeah, so large, uh, so uh, any, uh, so consumers with have more than uh, five, five megawatts, uh, they can negotiate directly with the generators. Uh, and then consumers who are between um, uh, 0 0.5 uh, megawatts and five megawatts, they can decide in which market they want to be, if they want to be in the regulated market or the non regulated market. Uh, th that's uh, interesting because. Uh... Chile was one of the first countries to liberal to start yes. the liberalization process, but then yes. let's say that the retail part of it is still, uh, uh, let's say, it didn't transition fully to yes. No, they do. Sector. They do have a very different different system. Yes. So everything is privatized, but because uh, there was a lot of concentration in terms of the numbers, so the, there were very few generators. So to to basically. Uh, because of the concentration of generators, that's the reason why they chose to go for uh, a cost-based system and basically why they have the, the options to actually determine the price uh, rather than having um, a, a system like the one there is here. I see. And uh, bye -bye. this probably has, has significant implications for demand uh, response because, of course, uh, a large part of your customers in Chile uh, well, they rely on these uh, regulated prices. So, mm -hmm. developing demand response based uh, solutions, uh, tariffs uh, uh, must take into account that. Yeah. Well, there are two sectors. So, I think so, that, 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 and the problems are different. So, one is for the free customers who they have very large loads and they are about almost 50% of the total consumption. Um, so, those are the mining and industrial companies. So, it's trying to understand. And those are the first ones that they are trying to be incorporated in demand response with the interruptible programs. So uh, yes, it's a is, I think it is a matter of studying exactly how much they can really provide because I've seen studies that some uh, mining companies can only provide about 10%, for example, which is still substantial. But uh, they re I mean, I haven't been able to find a lot of studies on their real capacity to do it. Uh, about the smaller consumers, uh, I think actually it is feasible and the reason I say that is uh, uh, because there was this thing about the net billing law. So the net billing law allows residential consumers to sell um, gener uh, generation, uh, <clears throat> their own generation to the grid. And, uh, and the system is quite good in the sense that they sell the generation to the grid and they receive in exchange both the cost of the electricity that they did not buy and also what they saved the company, the distributor, in terms of distribution charges. Mm. So they end up having an incentive to generate their own electricity instead of buying it from the distributor companies. And from the point of view of the distributor companies, they, uh, they don't lose anything by, so for them it's exactly the same to buy the electricity from um, <clears throat> distributor generation or from the last generators. The price is the same for them. So it's quite a good system, which I think it's worthwhile exploring to what extent is adaptable to demand response. I see, I see. Any question for Katarina? Yes, please. Sorry? Yes, um, please. Yeah, please open your camera and microphone uh, and, uh, and shout your question. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much, Katerina, for a very nice presentation and very interesting comparison between Chile, France, and UK. My, my thank you. 
is not connected in this case with the demand response. What uh, uh, I was asking there are very high renewable targets and expected levels of renewables. Could you please uh, say something more how it is feasible? Uh, about the, the, uh, the, um, the target for renewables? Yes. Yes. And level. To expand a bit more on that. 95% by 2000. Yes. yes, so 95% yes. is just... What, what kind of renewable may be? Yeah, so in terms of actual targets, the target is 70%. Mm -hmm. The thing is that after they set the target of 70%, they basically decided that the, and they announced it would become carbon neutral. And so the studies that try to uh, projections that show how can they become carbon neutral, they indicate that renewables may be anything between 80 and 95%. So this is not the target, this is just one of the scenarios of how to achieve the carbon neutrality. No, uh, nobody now, has studied if it is uh, achievable or not. Yes, yeah. So because the so the 80 to 90, so the, the, depending on the scenarios, it's the idea is to have between 80 and 95 percent. And some of that would be hydro. So about 20 percent uh, would be hydro and the other 70 to 75 percent um, would then be uh, variable renewable energy like solar and wind. Um, when you say in terms of uh, whether it would be feasible, so in terms of technical potential of the renewable CSCTs, they, they do have a, a, an extremely high potential in, in both in both uh, solar, I think, is one of the highest potentials in the world, and also very high in wind. Uh, they do have a system of tenders that has been very, very successful in terms of encouraging investment in renewable energy. So from those perspectives, it's, it's working. Um, uh, in terms of the flexibility, that's the area that is being uh, studied now. So uh, they are, they're, they're taking, Chile has taken a number of different initiatives to address the flexibility issue. Thank you. And you're welcome. Thank you. So since there are no other questions, I think uh, we can thank Katarina. I invite you, Katarina, to also watch, uh, uh, watch out the work of one of my colleagues because he, he did recently research on independent uh, aggregators in Europe okay. and the regulatory challenges. I will write you his name in the chat so you may have a yes. look. Thank you. Um, because he addressed uh, demand response in Europe uh, and the case for independent aggregators. Mm -hmm. And uh, having said that, we can uh, move, uh, unless Maria Bernadette show up, but it's not the case. We can move to the last uh, speaker, to Monica. Monica, uh, you have 20 minutes. Hi. Please. I can share the screen. Yes, please do. Hi everybody, good afternoon. My name is Monica Bolinari Teixeira. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. I'm taking my PhD in economy. I study at University Federal Fluminense. I've been writing this article with Luciano Mazecan and Niagara Rodrigues. The article is Road to the Market in Brazil, Price Determinants and Asymmetry and in Transmissions. The use of diesel oil in fight in Brazil due to its continental dimensions and the reason that road transport is the main mean of transport cargo carried out by transport companies and autonomous truck drivers. In October 2016, the new fuel price strategy was implemented at Petrobras refineries which read the main effect of frequent increases in fuel price. This promoted the truck stock in May 2018. 
it is imperative to emphasize the destructive effect of the combination of volat volatility and the upward trend in price, as urged in the months lead up to the strikes. After the strikes, the Brazilian government adopted a set of measures, among them the diesel pricing subsidy program and the reduction to ensure a reduction of 46 cents in the diesel price and the creation of the minimum October for the freight price. Thus, the present article aims to study the ASIM process in the transmission of final prices of diesel to the prices of the road freight, corn and soy in Brazil in the period between January the 2015 April the 2020. Asymmetry in price transmission, APT, concept. The asymmetric transmission or symmetric adjustment of the price is the phenomenon that explains the discrepancy and price adjustment of a given market between the reduction and the increase in prices. Types of APT, asymmetry of speed and magnitude. The asymmetry of magnitude is determined as the divergence in the magnitude of final prices adjustment in response to an increase or decrease in wholesale prices. Asymmetry is a speed refer to difference as time for positive and negative price adjustment. Positive asymmetry is the phenomenon rocks and feathers, or negative is the phenomenon rock and balloons. In the case of positive asymmetry, the retail price responds more intensely and faster to increases in the wholesale price to reduce, whereas in the negative asymmetry, the retail price responds more easily and faster to reduce on the wholesale price. This point it is very important. Hot and the feather effect. Prices increase quickly and intensely with a rocket and the fall sharp, sorry, and the fall slowly and in lesser intensity. Feather. The results in the fuel market. Rock and balloons effect. Prices fall quickly with the rock and rise slowly with a balloon. Cases of ATP, fact related to imperfectly competitive markets. The factor that can motivate the concurrency of asymmetric price transmission are the institutional and regulatory aspects of a given market. As examples, we can mention the case of different ECMS rates practiced by the states in the mandatory additional of diesel to diesel. Thus, the great to distance between distributors and biodiesel products, the higher the transport cost will be, thus intensifying asymmetries. Road freight market in Brazil. The truck strike was increases in the road transport sector, which was already facing a contract in demand due to a slowdown in economic activity and suffering the negative reflects of the government's incentive to finance troops. troops. This led to an increase in the circulation flat, removing and overcapacity in the market and increase in the contract of road freight. The structure of the road freight market is determined by the surplus and demand of transport service, cargo warrant demand service from the three models of transport, flat carriers, 
various vegetable grades and antioxidants. We try to market in Brazil. Continue. The price of this is the most significant cost in the formation of the price of road fire, represented 35% of the cost of cargo transportation. Thus, the prior the price of diesel, the higher the cost of diesel consumption will be, and consequently, the higher the price of the road freight. It is worth emphasizing that this transfer occurs differently between transport companies and autonomous truck drivers, since such companies establish formal contracts, the increase in the price of diesel is automatically passed on the freight price. In turn, autonomous truck drivers are unable to pass on the increase in the prices to cargo ones, as they do not have a contract. Thus, they end up assimilating the increase in cost in the structure. Finally, the price of a freight charge in the market is very sensitive to the increase in fuel price, as this significantly increases competition and decreases the profit margin of the activity. Methods, errors, corrections model, ACM and asymmetric adjustment. To investigate the long-term relationships and short-term dynamics between diesel price and freight price in Brazil, the econometric model now as the error correction ACM applied, applied sorry, in this extended exception for the case of asymmetric, West follow. Look at the equation one. On where delta indicates the first difference operator and epsilon t the error term. This expression includes the first difference in the diesel price variables PG and road five PF, the composite into positive and negative values. The same happened with the error correction terms, the third E. Test the, test the new hypothesis. Equation two shows magnitude symmetric. Equation three shows speed symmetry. Methods. Cost of asymmetry to consumers. The cost of asymmetry to consumers is measured by calculating the difference between the positive and negative cumulated response function, CRF. Thus, for the exercise, the stage of transmission from the diesel price to the price of hold Friday is considered. The CRF is defined as the expected and accumulated variation in the price of the product in period T plus J after a 1% variation in the price of input in period T. Thus, the cost to the consumer is represented by look at equation 4. Where CRF T plus J is the cumulative impact of T after T periods in the sum of the cumulative impact of the previous period. Of the contrary cost impact, 
from the dynamic effects of past change in product price and the effects of begin beyond outside the long time equilibrium trajectory. Analogously, the same ransom rules the off negative cumulative risk function. function. Results. Diesel price transmission of the price of road freight. The four models verified in equation one. This equation one. After estimating the coefficient, the idea was to carry out hypothesis tests to identify whether the positive and negative readjustment were passed on the same magnitude and speed from the diesel price to the fire price in this question three. This question two and three. The result, the result of the hypothesis test is that one variable is significant and the order is statistically equal to zero. That is, each word, each has a symmetry. Therefore, we reject the hypothesis with both speed and magnitude and find asymmetry. Thus, the CRF is estimated to the cost of asymmetry and be able to clasp it. Results and cost. The performance the exercise to one percent shocks were simulated one positive and the other negative on diesel price, so that the impact on the price of road freight over time were measured according to the question four. Question four. Consumer cost. The curve CRF positive blue curve shows positive shock. The curve CRF negative head curve shows a negative shock. The difference between the two shocks, the difference between the two curves is a consumer cost, the black curve. The consumer cost shows the losses arising from symmetries. Results on costs. CRF. You point. have, uh, Monica, you have uh, one minute. Okay. CRF shock the cumulated impact time when it was a positive shock at zero. The CRF negative shows a cumulated impact over time when there is a negative shock at C0. It, uh, this point is very important. The effect balloon is the difficulty of passing or positive readjustment completed and instantaneously because there are many computations in the road freight mark, except such as there are many surfaces in the road freight mark. Truck drivers have difficulties in transferring to increase prices to the price of the ride. 
If the truck drives transfer the entire diesel price increase to road freight, we will lose cost to competition. Thus, the balloon effect motivated the truck drive strike. Conclusions. Sorry. Conclusions. The usual has and fuel marks is hard to. Sorry. Conclusions. The user result and the full max and federal effects. The interesting point of the article is the identify the different partners that share the balloon and federal effect and how the balloon effect may have motivated the satisfaction and the truck drive strike in 2018. In addition, the assessment of road flight is determined in effect balloon. It's complex to clear and objectively accommodate all variables that determine the price of road flight together with their particular terms in the table of minimum price for road flight, whereas such a table besides generating distortion in the freight market can up solving the source of the problem, which is the excess capacity of drive transport. Finally, the analysis is important to assist us in the construction of expected public policy for the sector that aims to reduce the cost of transportation and the consequent increase in competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, uh, for your presentation. And uh, are you there? Yes, yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. So um, we have uh, a bit of time. Uh, I I wonder whether some of the uh, someone in the audience has questions for uh, Monica. I personally admit that I'm not uh, an econometric expert, so uh, I unfortunately cannot comment much uh, on the methods of the research, but uh, I can say that uh, it's uh, this idea of uh, asymmetry in the transmission of fuel prices uh, uh, was a topic uh, long debated also, also in Europe, especially some years uh, ago, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, when uh, prices of oil were uh, quite, quite larger whereas uh, uh, it's become a bit less relevant in the past uh, few years. Anybody? It's your last chance. <laughs> Apparently no, so uh, we can uh, thank Monica for, for your presentation. We, we have a still a bit of time. I, I don't know if you, uh, if some of you wants to raise uh, questions, uh, uh, not only to Monica, but also to Katarina and to uh, Ingela. Uh, if you did not have the opportunity earlier, uh, you have uh, time now. Um, Luciano, Niagara, Bruno, Francisco, uh, if you want to, to ask anything, to our uh, ladies. Actually, it was a very uh, gender balanced panel. Uh, it's a good sign that things also in uh, the profession of uh, economists are, are changing. Francisco, you have a question. Please open your microphone and uh, shout it out. Francisco, I think you, you are muted. Ah, yes. Yeah. I have a question for Monica. I want to know if there is any, any solution for the problems to solve the problem of the feather effect and the balloon effect. Uh, you are muted, uh, Monica. You are still muted. You have to unmute before. Oh, 
or otherwise, Tiark, maybe you can unmute uh, Monica. Uh, ah, perfect. Please, Monica. I write the answer in the chat, okay? If you prefer, uh, yes, if you don't feel comfortable, no problem. So we will give you time to, to write a bit. Um, and in the meanwhile, uh, well, I, I will close, uh, uh, well, approach the closing of the session. I also invite okay. those, those of you that uh, have uh, Twitter and LinkedIn to try to follow the conference also on those social media uh, at Florence School and uh, the International Association of Energy Economists. We are doing a great effort uh, in these days to increase the level of interaction also there. And sometimes it's a good way to uh, enable a higher visibility of our work and, uh, and to reflect further on what, uh, what has been said also in other sessions that unfortunately we could not attend because we, we have multiple one uh, um, to follow at the same time. And uh, that's it. Maybe an alternative, you know, is that Francisco write uh, uh, the, to Monica the, his email address so that Monica can uh, uh, forward to him uh, a more co comprehensive uh, uh, answer. Uh, could it work, Francisco? Yeah, okay, so actually if you go on the, on our, uh, on the um, program of the concurrent session, there is also the abstract of Monica and there, there are all the contacts of uh, uh, Monica as well. So, uh, Tiark, I think we can close. I thank you, you and uh, of course the speakers, uh, the audience, and uh, see you tomorrow online, I think. Yeah, just a small remark. Thank you very much for the attention and the, the question. Of course, it's uh, the end of a long day. Um, but I would like to invite the speakers to, um, if you haven't done so yet, upload the, the slides on the platform. So then you can also see from the others um, what has been presented. And otherwise, also, same for me. Have a nice evening and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.